Welcome to the People Property Place podcast with me, your host, Matthew Watts, founder and managing director of Rockbourne. This is a podcast where I share the stories, views, opinions, and career journeys of the movers, shakers, innovators, and leaders in the real estate industry. Welcome to the People Property Place podcast. Today, we're joined by Lloyd Lee, uh, co-founder and managing partner of U Capital. Lloyd brings over 20 years experience in real estate, private equity and principal investing and has been involved in over £12 billion worth of real estate acquisitions, public and private corporate opportunities, special situations and asset management turnarounds across the UK, Europe, US and emerging markets. His experience combines bold bracket private equity experience at Starwood Capital and Marathon Asset Management, and he has granular knowledge of all major real estate asset classes. And he's been a fundamental value investor in real estate on behalf of major institutional public and private investors since 1998. Lloyd, welcome to the podcast. The place I always like to start is how how did you get into real estate? It's an interesting question. I think in many respects, all of us uh, live in real estate one way or the other. Everyone has a house, go someplace to work or to school. You go shopping, go eating, you stay in hotels. And I think that for me, real estate creates a way of life. And I think for me, that was always fascinating, even as a student. And as a result, I think it's something that I just found myself very passionate about from a very, very young age. I was drawing like houses when I was like eight. I don't know why, but that's what I did when I was an eight-year-old. You didn't and I remember, I remember meeting an architect at the time who came in for class. I think he was someone's dad. And he's like, is your dad an architect? I'm like, no. And he's like, well, well you're like drawing houses and floor plans and other kids are drawing dogs or whatever. And I just, it was one of those things that always fascinated me and it still does to this day. Did you have any kind of parents or family friends who are in real estate? Or was it no, just I didn't. Your- it's just something that was born with me, I don't know. And I genuinely still feel that way today, which is a nice thing. So how did you flip that from drawing houses at eight years old <laughs> into, into real estate private equity? How did you go on a journey? So, so I think that all the way through school, I did two majors. So when I was at Harvard, I did both pre-med and I also did history of architecture. And I did them in parallel. One was because I had to be functional and the other was because it was my passion. And passion won out in the end, which is probably a good thing. And it led me really to move forward to go to Cornell, where I studied uh, real estate. And from there, it was quite obvious at that point that I'd picked a career path. Um, And the question is, how is that career path going to manifest itself? And so when when I began in New York in the 90s, it was kind of the workout days, sadly, um, from the standpoint of the economy. Workout days, fantastically, from the standpoint of professional experience of learning what to do and what not to do, because you've seen the aftermath of a remarkable fall from grace from the real estate sector. The late 80s were the go-go days, and then it literally collapsed in tears in the 90s. And the workouts was really where I began my career. And we would go to, we would go to empty office buildings because there were a lot of them. And there would be boxes to the ceiling of files that were half complete on loans that had gone pop, on banks that had disappeared on whole books of portfolios where no one knew anything. And that was literally where, where I began my career at a company called Kenneth Leventhal. And KL eventually got bought by Ernst & Young and became kind of the strategic advisory arm of that business. So it was an advisory, um, it was an advisory business. Correct, it was. And one of our largest clients at the time uh, was Starwood Capital. And Starwood Capital Group, run and founded by Barry Sternlake uh, to this day, was the largest client of the firm at the time. And we were following in their wake doing advisory work for the firm. And three years into being at KL, I joined Starwood Capital Group. And that became a journey of, of being in real estate private equity. I will say that the leap forward to Starwood Capital in many respects, in hindsight, was an obvious one. They're such a remarkable firm. I'm enormous admiration for the leadership there. But I think for a, for a young guy in his 20s, there was still a career path jump that needed to be made as to, are you going to go into more advisory or are you going to go into principal investing? And I think for me, that's a personal decision you just have to take as to who you are. And for me, the idea of real estate was, again, deeply rooted in who I was. And I think the idea of owning, investing, taking principal decisions was very much in my mindset. And as a result, 
it was a natural choice for me to go into that industry. And Starwood Capital Group was for me and, and still is today definitive as, as the leading firm in the, in the industry. Did you have advice? Or did you take advice from mentors at the time? Or was it just, you know, it's actually interesting. Kind of Harvard and Cornell, you know, your understanding of like real estate as an ecosystem developed in a different career path? I've, I've always taken the time to ask experienced smart people what they think. I think it's just, it's just a smart thing to do. And at the time, I remember where I was on, um, I think it was on the two and the three going downtown to Wall Street to a client. And I asked Howard Roth, I think he's, he might have just retired, but he was the senior tax partner at the time. And we were doing some tax work uh, for a client downtown in Wall Street. And I asked him about, you know, the kinds of things that I was interested in doing. And he said, yeah, it's called private equity. And this is some of our clients who do that. And I started working on those accounts when I was at KL. So yeah, actually, definitely. Howard Roth. So you joined Starwood Capital. I did. Advisor moved to a client. Yes. What was your initial role at Starwood Capital? And then how did that, that develop? So the role was originally in asset management. And as you know, in private equity, some houses will have guys who work on investments, as in new acquisitions on behalf of the firm. And then what happens is they have an in-house team that takes over from the acquisition date to actually managing those assets to fruition. And I joined on the asset management side of the team uh, with a young generation of new people joining the firm. And within a year, was asked to join the acquisitions team. Uh, and actually quite rapidly from joining the firm, I was asked to look at a few new acquisitions. But I think equally, one of the things that happened while I was there was the whole ethos of being an owner really kicked in even more than it had at KL for me, where what I realized is, and I, and I say to this, all of the guys in the firm, you know, there is the firm, but then there's you incorporated. You are your own business. It's your career. It's your life. And you have to take ownership of that. And so what I would do is I would basically work on all of the asset management stuff that I had to do because that was my primary role. Of course it was during the day and late into the evenings. And then I would work till like three or four o'clock in the morning on the acquisitions. Um, and Barry's an early morning guy and I am not. And so I would be in the office at 7, 7.30 because I knew Barry would be there. And it was long days, long hours, but it allowed me to have exposure to the acquisition side of the team. And within a year, I was asked to join full time, which was very exciting for me. And then about, I think maybe a year and a half, two years, something like that. It's been a while. It's been a long while. <laughs> I was asked to start getting on a plane to go to London. So you're from the US, right? I am. So born and raised. Born and raised. In New York. Just outside New York. So that was your upbringing, your ecosystem, your world. And then what prompted you to want to jump on a plane and come over to Europe? It was interesting. I, I, again, I remember where I was sitting. I think, I think it was either Barry or Jeff Dishner said, we've got this deal in London. Who's got capacity? And I raised my hand. I just did. I actually had capacity. It wasn't that I had this penchant for, for traveling or anything. I just was like, sure, I'm interested and I've got capacity. I'll do it. And, and I, that was usually my inclination in life, which is like, if you have a little bit of capacity, say yes. If you don't have capacity, make sure you make capacity and then say yes. And as a result, I got on a plane with Jeff Dishner and came over to, to London and started looking at deals. And over dinner, we were in South Kent at the time. And he was like, you know what? I'm like, what? It's like, you should do international. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah. I'm like, okay. And the next thing you know, I'm living out of a suitcase for 18 to 24 months from that day and start literally spending a week in London, a week back in the office, a week in London, a week back in the office, working on joint ventures and partnerships and all those kinds of things. And it was an amazing experience. So you were the first guy on the ground. That to you, live here. To live here. Correct. And so I moved here in 2000 and late 2002, 2003, and moved here and I've lived here ever since. And Starwood at, this, at, this, at the time, did it have an international footprint or was it just predominantly out of the Starwood, US? Starwood Capital definitely had one on the corporate side because of the huge corporate opportunities the firm had engaged in, in the hotel world. And so in fact, they'd actually created two public hotel, two companies, two public companies at the time, a hotel company and then a mortgagery company. And so the answer is categorically yes. From a more traditional asset investment side, I think at the time they had gone out to Asia first, and then this was the first foray into Europe to actually put like boots on the ground in this part of the world. 
And so what were the kind of assets that you were looking at? What are the kind of deals that, that you were looking at? It, it was opportunistic. Uh, Starwood Capital, as far as I know, whenever I was there, was always opportunistic. They, they have expanded quite a lot since I've left. But at the time, it was definitely opportunistic. And we were in multiple jurisdictions looking at where we found value, untapped value, hidden value, misunderstood assets, which is what private equity guys do. And was that within the, the hotel? Space? No, it wasn't. It was kind of across the across It the wasn't. Door? And I think the reason at the time was because there had been so much activity in hotels that ultimately led to the public company that we actually had a non-compete at the time with the hotel company in hotels. So in fact, we didn't do any hotel deals at the time on the private side because there was the public company. And there could not be a, a conflict of interest between you know, really the leadership of the firm, which was Barry and Jeff, and I think at the time, Jonathan Elian and a number of others were Kleeman. There couldn't be a, a conflict of interest where they were basically doing private deals on the private equity side. And then on the public equity side, which is obviously the hotel company also doing deals. So as a result, the private side did not do hotel deals at that time. And were you working or were you trying to find operating partners to JV up with? Everything. Or was it just everything. Everything. It's funny, actually. I don't know if it's funny or sad. I think it's actually funny. One of our first joint venture partners that I found is just, we're having lunch, I think, later this week because he's retiring. Yeah. So there you go. Time has it's been a little over 20 years now. So you moved to London and you've kind of stayed since. And were you responsible for kind of building the team in yeah. London from scratch? Yeah. Talk to me about how you went around doing that. So when I first landed, um, I was literally meeting people in a hotel lobby because we literally just started from scratch. You still uh, do that. It's always, always a good experience to have to do it yourself. I mean, do it myself with an enormously powerful firm, you know, supporting everything. But it started out from a granular, you know, detailed business in a hotel lobby where you're meeting, you know, PAs and then associates and then looking for office space and you're going to go get the fax machine and all that good stuff. And I think that in many respects, it starts to test whether you have an internal compass. There are some brilliant, brilliant investors in this world who I think within, the, within an organizational structure where there is a CIO and there's macroeconomic views and there's kind of like big plays that are being put through the organization, like at a major bank where there's a lending side and an investment side and then like a client side. There are brilliant deal people there who kind of go at and just attack and deliver and execute. But what I've noticed is that sometimes you take those people out of those organizations and you put them literally on their own and they need to have an entirely self-sufficient internal compass. And they don't. Um, and, it, you know, I'm not perfect by a long way, um, but there are certain things that you need to have if you're going to do it yourself. And having an internal compass is definitely one of them. Um, and the trial by fire is, is when a big firm like Starwood Capital sends you over to another country to get started, you better have one because it's important. You really need to know what your priorities are and how to focus on them. And what, what age were you at this stage? Good how gracious. What, what age was I? And, and what was your job title as well when you kind of landed over here? I think I was a vice president or a director at the time, or main director at the time. And it would have been, I would have been 30. Okay. 30 or 31. So you'd been with the firm for a number of years at this stage before you came over. Three years. Three years. Three and you'd flown up the ranks quite quickly. Well, Starwood, Starwood was really supportive of me, I have to say. I don't look at it as flying up any ranks quickly. I think they were just very, very supportive of people who really wanted to go out there and do something interesting. And I'm grateful for that opportunity. And so you built the business over here in the UK and Europe? I did, although I think me building it is, is probably a bit, a bit much. The Starwood Capital Group is a pretty remarkable infrastructure and their leadership is quite strong. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't sit here and try and tell you that I, I built some kind of a European business. I think I was definitely part of what happened in Europe. Yeah. Um, and so in that respect, it was a great experience for me. And what, what prompted, because you were with the business just shy of nine years, what prompted yeah. you to leave the business? And what was the kind of so key it's, that? It's day? interesting. When I was 20, good gracious, well, how old? When I was 24, I sat at Cafe Mozart on 71st in Broadway, which is about a year into joining Kenneth Leventhal. And I actually put down on a piece of notebook paper, which I still have, Three trees. Three trees of what did I want to do with my career? And one of them was to stay in the consulting business, which is where I was, and just become a partner in that firm or another firm. One was to go into kind of more pure play, leisure, entertainment, hospitality assets, and to go work in, in that business. 
And the third was private equity. And then within those trees, it was like, okay, well, what do I want to do within those trees? And so for private equity, it was either become, you know, responsible for a region for the world for a really, really big firm or to start my own firm. Uh, and I've kept that piece of paper all these years and I update it every year, but where I'm going for the next 20 years. And so for me, I'm about, I think I'm about six, six or seven years off my original plan when I was 24. But it's not far off in the sense that the, the direction of travel is here I am and now co-owner of a business. And it's much, much smaller than the businesses I used to work for, but it's our business. And I love it that way. I have to say it, it's something that keeps you up at night and gets you up in the morning. So I think it's got the best of both worlds. Before you, before you set your business up, you worked at Marathon, is that right? I did. I did. There was a period of time when I was just kind of looking at options as you do sometimes in your career. and. It was one of those things that, that kind of, I think it was genuinely a godsend. I was talking to my current business partner about setting up the business in 2007. And as you do when those moments come, and you're like, okay, well, if I'm going to look, I'm going to look properly. As we were talking about partnership terms, I got an, an unsolicited offer to go interview with Marathon. And I remember calling John, my current business partner, and I'm like, John... And he's like, oh, no. I'm like, I know, I know. I, you know, it's just a big ship. It's an interesting opportunity, and I'm going to take it. And he's like, okay, well, look, let's just stay in touch. And I'd known John for many, many years already. And we did. And then literally a year later, I think we spoke, and we're like, that's the best thing we never did because the world had exploded. Whatever we thought we could build in a year would probably have been dismantled, not because of anything we did, just the world just got dismantled. And then in 2009, we sat down. I think it was like December. And we're like, much better time to be talking now. It'll be a lot harder because money is not you know, readily available. Things will be difficult. But I'm like, boy, that feels like the 90s again. Here we are. You know, cardboard boxes and workouts and restructurings and all kind of messy stuff. I, I kind of know what this feels like. And certainly John did. And as a result, we got started, set up our partnership in 2010, kind of mid to late 2010. And there you go. And it was... You're obviously London HQ, London based. Yeah. You kind of never moved back to the US. I didn't. Conscious, conscious thing. You just fell in love with London. And I, I, I have to say, it. there's a lot to love about London. And so I think from, from that perspective, the answer is yes. But I, I think it, you need to understand what I mean by when I say I fell in love with London. I've always been focused on the business or focused on business. And so personally, I'm opportunity led by business. And so if I think that London is a great city to do business in, then that becomes where I live. Uh, and London is an amazing place to do business. And I think from a real estate perspective, it's an amazing place to do business. And I'd kind of grown up, if you think about it, coming over at 30, and now was whatever it was, 38, 39. And you're kind of like relationships at that level start to grow. And you know that they're going to advance and grow locally as well, um, which is exactly what's happened. And Half our deal flow comes from people that I knew 20 years ago or 15 years ago. And I think that that for me meant this was a logical place for me to be because it was a great market. The relationships were here. The knowledge base was here. And it was just kind of a natural step where, again, I had been forced to have an internal compass uh, or it's certainly forced to prove that I had an internal compass from a young age. And as a result, I'm like, well, my compass says this is still true north. What was the risk at the time in terms of setting up the business? You know, it's, it's always a risk. And I, and I think you know that. It's never easy. I think that the, the risk exists, but there's only one reason anyone ever does it. And it's because you look at the other side of the hump and you also have the opportunity. No one would go in and start their own business if there was only one hump, which is basically the downside. It's because it's both. It's control, it's focus, and then there's the thrill an opportunity of owning your own business and of literally being able to reap what you sow. And I think for me, that's always been very exciting since I was 24 when I wrote it on that piece of notebook paper. Um, and so I think for me, that risk at the time seemed well-timed, if I'm honest. It just seemed like the right time to get started, even though I knew it'd be 10 times harder to start the accelerator button because the world was really tough, particularly for guys like us. At that stage, you know, late 30s or so, you know, you're kind of very established in terms of your career. You're probably used to a certain income and lifestyle, and you've got personal relationships and other things that you need to kind of manage. How did you, how did you work through 
or rationalize those kind um, of conversations? I think in the end, if you're going to do it, just do it. And that's what it has to come down to. You can't go in halfway. I don't think you go into half anything in life halfway. Some people do. I don't. And that's not because I'm better than anyone else. It's just because it's just how I'm wired. But particularly if you're going to go into this part of, of the category class, you have to give everything. You have to be ready to do that. Because if you don't, unless you're very fortunate, which some people are, or very gifted, which some people are, the number of knockbacks you're going to experience will put you off from it. It's tough. It's very, very tough. But if you will put everything you've got into it and you just never stay down and you get back up again, you've got a very good chance. Talk to me about John, your business partner, and sure. how you met him and then how you- So it's actually, an, it's an interesting story. John is a very successful self-made entrepreneur in real estate. I think he, he basically started when he was 19 and then co-founded Manhattan Loft Group, then went on to found you group the design and branding company with Philippe Stark. And actually, Barry Sternling was kind enough to introduce us. When I was moving over here, Barry's like, I'm going to introduce you to a few people that you get your feet wet, get to know people in London. And John was one of them. And so I kind of remember sitting with John in his office, which was brand new at the time because he just set up the U Design Business with Philippe. And then in 2009, we set up U Capital to basically be a standalone real estate private equity firm. Uh, which it is today. And it's been, I guess that would probably make it almost eight years of knowing each other personally and socially before we actually became business partners. And now we've been business partners for almost 12, 13 years. Uh, it's been great. And so did he provide some of the operational infrastructure in terms of getting the business off the ground or was it some of the seed capital? How, how so, so yes, the answer is yes. And John is one of those people who does that quite a lot actually as an entrepreneur in lots of different businesses. And uh, over time, uh, we have both invested very considerably into the business today, whereby it now is an important and meaningful investment business for both of us. And I think that the idea, as always, of leveraging off of that infrastructure is when you have to tread on very, very carefully, because I have seen people take on too much too soon and then have to unravel it all when it doesn't work out. And so I refused to do that up front. We kept it extremely lean. It was just the two of us plus another person who joined uh, who'd been with John for many, many years, who's now a senior partner at the firm. And that was it. Like we, had, we didn't take on almost any admin, nothing, because it just was costing the business too much until we were ready. So it was literally doing everything, cash flow models, investments, memos, negotiations, running around the whole nine yards, um, setting up your own schedule. There was like no admin at all on purpose. And then slowly we started to build the business. And I think Honestly, it took us until from 2010 until 2014 when we actually had dedicated full-time staff. It was very difficult. Uh, and at the time, we had $800 million, so about $500 million sterling of assets under management at the time. So between zero and $500 million, we didn't hire anybody on purpose because I just didn't want anything to go wrong and feel like, we have to unravel people. We wanted to make sure that when we hired people, if they left, it was either because they didn't want to stay or we did not want them to stay. It wasn't because they could not stay because the firm could not sustain it. The foundations weren't strong enough to stay. Correct. Them. Correct. And so we've been fortunate in that we've been able to do that through some very, very difficult times. And now we have almost 20 people and we have something on the order of three and a half to four billion under management. And it's been an important, it's been an important kind of fundamental point of principle that we stick to, which is how we look after our team. And what we say to our people is we're, we, we put everyone in a position to be successful. We set our people up for success um, because if we get it right and if they are successful, then by definition, the firm is that much more successful. And so there is a complete alignment in that. And we work very, very hard to do that. So we're not only hiring people that we think are genuinely talented and will work well within the firm. We're also from day one, literally trying to look forward about where that person's going to end up or how they have opportunities to grow within the firm um, and continue to advance their own personal and professional careers while at the same time advancing the firm. At the time when you set you capital up, was it an operating partner? Did you raise a discretionary fund off the bat? What was the kind of the <laughs> business model? And talk to me about that. The, 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 the ethos at the time, just do smart investments. I think that 
it wasn't any more complicated than that because you don't raise, I mean, I should say you, one does not readily raise discretionary capital uh, when you're coming at the market like we were. We were not like the head of Goldman Sachs, you know, global principal investing, and you want to go raise like a billion dollars tomorrow when you leave and set up your new firm. That, that was not us. And so effectively, we started from scratch, which is go put some money together, go try and do deal by deal, prove to people that you can do it, and then maybe they'll start investing with you. And so for us, the one thing we stuck to very, very firmly, despite how tempting it was sometimes to step away from it, was we could not fall into the temptation of doing smaller, easier deals just to pay the bills. And let me tell you, it was tough sometimes not to, but we stuck to it because what we realized is if you go to an institution and you've done a small deal, it doesn't help them. It doesn't help them get comfortable that you can manage complex, larger deals that institutions like to invest in. So as a result, we had to basically do a little bit of elephant hunting at the time. And so the smallest deal that we've ever done is like 150 million sterling. We didn't do the 20s or the 10s or the 50s or the 75s because it would be difficult, I think, at some point in the future to say, well, we've done like 12 deals all under 5 million. And they're like, but that doesn't do anything. That, that combined is 60 million pounds. Like, that's, I don't even get out of bed for that as an institution. I need something twice that size to get started. But isn't the process the same, though, regardless of the size of the asset? You know I mean, what? not maybe at the 5 mil, but at it, the, it, the 40 is, or 50. It is and it isn't. They often say that doing a big deal and doing a small deal, but there is something about scale that starts to make things more complicated, more people, more money, uh, more committees. You need 2 million pounds, you can probably scrap around and find it. You need 200 million pounds, tougher. You need 2 billion pounds, much, much tougher. And I think that the market and the industry recognize that. And as a result, we knew the market and the industry recognized that. And we knew we had to demonstrate to the market and to the industry, we could do it. And so we stuck to that very, very hard. And so the first deal we did was in a, like a ragtag consortium of very talented people where we got involved with a group and took forward a first major restructuring deal. Failed auction, you know, great story, but it was tough. And it was 200 some odd million gross value. So it was a, it was a good sign. But it was difficult. It took almost 18 months to close that first deal. We had like seven sets of lawyers on it. And it was tough, but it was the first start. So you got your first peg in the sand, proved the concept, you've got the capacity and ability to be able to do it. Tell me about the growth from there and the strategy, because I'm right in saying you're a contrarian investor. I mean, I, I think lots of people talk about being contrarian investors. And I think that, I think we tend not to focus on being contrarian just for the sake of it. I think we try to focus on what we believe to be our own internal compass. It turns out it happens to be quite often that that means we are contrarian because we are very fundamental value investors. And when you are fundamental value, you're looking at the fundamentals. And the world, despite how often it's supposed to look at fundamentals, it doesn't. It gets emotional. It, it looks at volatility. It gets nervous or scared. It overcorrects. And when you add all of that up, it's surprising how far sometimes it can deviate from the fundamentals. And as a result, we find ourselves in positions where we are perceived to be contrarian. And whether we are or we're not, it doesn't matter. We just do what we think is correct and generating good fundamental returns and value for our investors. But I will say, if you look back over the last 13 years, we were busy in 10, 11, 12. We had sold everything by 13, 14. We did no deals in 15. Then the specter of Brexit started to come around the corner and we started getting busy. And then Brexit actually happened and we got super busy. In fact, that's within like 90 days or whatever it was, we'd started to look at deals. And a number of months later, we ended up buying Olympia. Um, and to the point that you had about kind of like carrying the business forward, it was actually in 15 when we realized there's not a whole lot to do in London. Lots of people are doing stuff. We think the tide is too high. We don't think there's fundamental value in the market very much um, for what we do. And as a result, we started focusing on capital formation, but a new kind of capital formation, which is finding committed capital versus the last few years, which have been doing deal by deal. And in our pipeline, we identified public companies as being a great, great place to focus on. And what we saw was a significant, again, emotional volatility play discrepancy going on where 
private valuations were fairly stable, but at risk of moving because of Brexit. But the public markets had kind of already priced the Brexit risk in, and we were seeing risk of, of a, um, a widening of that gap where public valuations were starting to drop. And so we were starting to look very, very heavily at public companies. And that was really part of a big part of our presentation to our now current partners and investors uh, back in 2015. And sure enough, we come back and sign the papers in February of 16 or whatever it was. And the next thing you know, Brexit happens like 90 days later and we're off. We're like, this is what we said might happen. Here we are. And public valuations are gonna stay down for a while, which means people have liquidity crunches, uh, pressures on their balance sheet. They need you know, creative solutions to figure stuff out, get stuff off their balance sheet, raise liquidity. And that's exactly what we got going doing with Olympia. So you raised the capital, you had a discretionary fund at that stage to take advantage of this stuff. We, we had basically the interim step, which is basically a, what they call a pledge fund, which is it's $200 million. It allows you to basically be real in the marketplace where you have capital and it's captive to invest into your strategy. But it's not discretion in the sense that you legally have the right to just call cap, which is what we have now. But it was a very powerful interim step because it allowed us to go to people like public companies and be serious and say, yes, we can buy this. Whereas before it would have been like, well, yes, we can, but we have to simultaneously put the capital together, which we did do for 500 million sterling's worth. But to engage seriously with the public company, sometimes it would do better than that, particularly if you're gonna buy something of some substantial size, yeah. which Olympia was, we bought it for 296 million back in 17. Yeah, talk to me about Olympia and that deal, because sure. you spoke about elephant hunting. That, that is a whole herd of elephant. It, it is. I, I think that um, it's, it's, a, it's a classic real estate play in our book, not in everyone's book, because it had all the fundamental pieces that played to our strengths. First, we identified it because there was this falling public valuation discrepancy and this widening gap to private valuations. So you had a vendor who needed to do a deal for their own reasons that weren't necessarily market related. And we kind of like those because it means we're doing a deal with them because both parties are doing it for their own respective reasons. Uh, it's not a volatility play. It's like, I have a balance sheet thing I want to fix. You have capital you want to deploy. It works for both of us, do it. And that's what happened. And so <laughs> it allowed the vendor to basically take capital and receipts and deploy it into their business in a way that suited them and allowed us to basically get our hands on an asset that we liked. So it, it began with a good story. The second part of the story is what were we buying? And it's interesting that because it was an operating business, because you had 135 employees and it was running exhibitions as it had done since 1886, consecutively throughout that whole period of time, it wasn't a traditional play for a pure real estate investor. It was like, what am I gonna do with 135 full-time equivalents running an exhibition business. I kind of understand the fact that I'm buying 14 acres of freehold in West London, but then equally what you found is that the pure corporate private equity guy look at it like, like I could buy that business, but what would I do with 14 acres of freehold real estate? Like I'm not, a, I'm not a developer, I'm not a real estate guy. And as a result, that's a bit too much clay for me to be molding in order to generate my returns. And it literally fell between the cracks from the two key groups that should have been looking at it, and I think probably had looked at it in the past. But for us, that's our sweet spot because we've done a lot of operational real estate, hotels and all kinds of stuff. And at the same time, understood real estate at a relatively granular level. So for us, that again, played to our strengths. Um, and then the third piece was what did we actually see? And it was interesting that you could scale up or down Olympia in our underwriting from something pretty straightforward to something quite complex. And if you look at the original memo, it actually presented both cases. But what we said was the second case, the more complicated case, the bigger vision case, is something we have conviction in because it's important to feel like you've underpinned what you're doing by a longer term value play. But in the memo, it did say it's like a 15 to 20 year play if you really want to go the distance. Because if you looked around the map of London and all of the kind of big Victorian arches, places, the Covent Gardens, the Camden markets, the borough markets, the Spitalfields markets, all of the big, big places that have been built over time, inevitably they morphed into great destinations 
for people of all walks in life to come and visit and do things. Um, and we're like, we don't have one of those in the west part of London, other than this one, built by the Victorians in the 19th century. And, and by the way, people already come here for exhibitions. So for us, it was a great long-term play, but it wasn't something that was in our original plan of attack day one, day two. But day three, we started to test the waters about what we thought was possible there because as a, as a real estate investor, your nose is always leading you a bit. There's just instinct. And for us, the instinct was, this is 14 acres of freehold. It's such a great asset. It's such a gem. It needs to be polished perfectly. And if you're gonna do some amount of work, don't unravel the long-term opportunity. Know what that opportunity is first, then figure out if you can do it in two phases or all at once. And naturally, we decided to do it all at once. Um, and we're very fortunate that the investors have been very supportive of that vision. But within literally a year and a half, we were effectively up and running with delivery of the now current vision, which is something like 24, 27 months away from completion. Wow. So that takes us to about whatever that is, a little less than seven and a bit years from literally the day we closed on the acquisition. I drive past it often and it's got the cranes outside and the pool. It is the largest privately placed contract in the country, construction contract in the country. Um, so that probably puts it pretty high up there within Europe, I would have thought. Um, we're very, very fortunate. We've got a lot of great um, institutional capital behind it. Um, BVK, VKB, our partners, Deutsche Finance. Uh, but our lenders, you know, NatWest um, and Bank of Ireland and, and the lead uh, is Goldman Sachs. So very, very fortunate. And those relationships with those different businesses, did you have relationships with them early on in your career and you've kind of ridden, ridden the wave and ridden the relationships or are they new relationships? It's a mix, brought, it's a mix actually. We, um, if you look at the history of the firm, we've always had a mix of old and new. I think we're always creating new relationships. It's just part of the business. But we'd also found that through trust, you could build off of existing relationships to do new things. Uh, so I'd known partners at Deutsche Finance for 10 years before we got started. We knew the guys at Goldman a bit. We also, in some of our earlier deals, um, had done business with people who had come back to do more business with us at Olympia. So it was one of those things where we were kind of all helping each other a little bit because we just enjoyed doing business together. And that theme has continued where most of the major players who have done business with us over the last 10 years. 12 years, 13 years, have come back again at various different levels and guises. And I'd like to think that, that speaks well for us. We think it certainly speaks well for them because we've enjoyed going back and doing business with existing partners. And I think that, you know, Olympia is definitely a story co-authorship where what we realize is given the scale of it, the idea of bringing the world's greatest international national and local, and importantly, local names in arts, entertainment, music, culture, fashion, nonprofits, and you know, private sector, we thought was a great story, which frankly was true to what Olympia had been since 1886, which is it's an exhibition business. It's a showcase for other people. Uh, and we're like, well, why wouldn't we do that in what Olympia is going to become by creating an operating platform where we co-author live entertainment venues or hotels or restaurants or offices with people who are great at doing it and allow them to use Olympia as a showcase for what they do. And that is what Olympia is today. It is a showcase for the original exhibition business, for theater, live entertainment, education. We're opening a school for the arts, which we're super excited about, but also as a platform for some of the most beloved nonprofit organizations in music where they came to Olympia because they realized that we could give them a huge platform to tell the world what they do in, in, um, in therapy, in music therapy, which they didn't have at the time when they were operating. And they've been around since like 1901. Um, so I think for us, the story of co-authorship at Olympia has been a rewarding one. And it has built new and more relationships for us. And some of those have yet again gone on to do more business with us since. So it's exciting. Tell me about the other assets in your portfolio. So we, after Olympia, we then, to the point you asked earlier, then actually did raise discretionary capital. So it's U Capital Fund 2. One is, is kind of the, the pledge. And that is a discretionary fund. 
And we, again, focused on the core fundamentals of having an internal compass, building on existing relationships and building new ones. And so one of the earlier relationships that we had uh, was with the uh, now former head of UNI, uh, which before that was DevSec, Development Securities, Matthew Weiner. And I'd known Matthew for probably 15 years at the time. And I called him because I was looking at his share price. I was tracking where his company was at the time. And I called him and I said, look, I, it's been a while. I don't think the market's been particularly kind to you. It's nothing that you don't already know. But I guess what I would say is I'm not convinced that they've got it right. Oftentimes, public markets can be, again, volatility-based, emotional, and overcorrecting. And perhaps that's happened here. The question is, what are you and I going to do about it? And if the answer is nothing, that's nothing. But I'm putting in the courtesy call because if there is something you'd like to do and we could be helpful to you, we'd love to do it. And that literally began the discussion of what are we going to do? And a year later, we ended up buying Shepherd's Bush Market, taking it off their balance sheet, restructuring the debt, uh, replacing the lender completely, uh, and taking complete control of the market, which we now have done. And really reworking the entire storyline of Shepherd's Bush Market from scratch which was originally it was slated to be, unfortunately, kind of forcibly removing some of the local area occupiers, putting on luxury housing and doing some affordable because you have to under law. Um, and we completely tore up that business plan and started from scratch um, because the thing that that plan did not, did not really hold in, in the highest regard was the market traders. It's Shepherd's Bush market because they were market traders. It was all about the housing. Um, and so we said, go back to fundamentals. This market is here because the market traders are here from the 1900s. And some of them are fourth generation market traders. They have a story to tell that's very, very powerful. And there are generations of people who've gone to the market and grown up in the market and around the market. And we started creating a storyline where actually it's about the market. Let's actually reinvest into that market and make it great again. Uh, because it had fallen on hard times. And what happened as a result of that is as we started to look into that business with the market traders, one market trader at a time, we started to kind of find roots to tell more stories. And one of them was in the sciences, which is that Imperial had obviously put their campus not 10 minutes away. Um, and we started speaking to Imperial about what they were doing there. And John Anderson, who's been hugely supportive, is now a partner of ours, uh, as on behalf of Imperial, to open the largest life sciences incubator in the country at Shepherd's Bush Market. And so all of the luxury housing is gone, and now it's being replaced by um, sciences. And we're very, very excited about that. And so we're investing into the market, building spaces for the life sciences, uh, in keeping with what I guess you could call kind of the Imperial Knowledge Quarter. Um, and then because we just think it's the right thing to do, we took the original consent of affordable housing, which at the time was mandated because you're doing luxury housing. And we're like, well, we're not doing any housing. So technically we don't have to do any, but we're going to just make the message that we're here to be responsible. And we're not only going to deliver the, uh, the affordable housing, we're going to double it. And 100% of it will be affordable housing. Um, and that is something we just felt was the right thing to do. Um, off the back of that, the fund was now invested. Um, into that asset, and we've been working on it. And we then went out and bought um, the Savile Theater, um, which was a deal that had come on hard times for its own reasons. And we saw an opportunity there to go against the grain, which was normally you just take a theater, shut it, put in commercial. And we thought, we can do better than that. Um, it's London. And we made a pledge to put a proper full-on theater back into the building and add hospitality in and around the building to kind of make it stack up because theaters are very expensive to run, operate, and to build. But they're worth it because you're investing into the long-term fabric of London. And when you do that right, it does pay super long dividends, but you know, you, you've got to pay investors who took that risk today. Um, and so in creating kind of a more of a mixed-use environment, we discovered that actually a lot of people in theater really want that. Um, eating, dining, you know, hospitality. I think the idea of doing that in the mix makes for a more interesting place where it's not just open from seven in the evening till 10 o'clock at night or 10.30 and then it's shut the rest of the day. Just London has to work harder than that 
in its real estate assets to provide stuff, experiences, places, services for people who come to London and expect the best. Um, and so in creating the vision of a mix, um, we're very, very excited about it. It's a long way to go, but it is in keeping again with kind of the complexity of assets that we find where we are polishing what we call a hidden gem. Lloyd, mindful of time, and I've got so many more questions that I could ask you from building a high-performing team to having a really long-term vision to you know, underwriting and how you kind of get the, the financial return from all these, these investments to ESG, to impact, to high-performing team. There's so much more that I want to ask you, but I'm respectful of your, your time. But a question that I ask everyone who joins me on the podcast is, if I was to give you 500 million pounds of equity, who are the people, what property, in which place would you look to deploy that capital? So uh, it's interesting, timely question. The answer is we would be and are doing the deal that we're doing next. Um, So we have something that we're closing uh, quite shortly um, in a very, very creative space in London. We're very excited about it. And I think it speaks to the potential, the enormous long-term potential of London as a gateway city in the world, possibly the gateway city in the world. Uh, the one thing that, that as fundamental value investors we look at is why do people come to London? Why do people come to London as a place? It's, if they're coming to London as a place, it's the real estate as well that will benefit from that. And the level of demand for talent is extraordinary in this world. And London happens to be one of the most talented workforces. Um, And if you you talk to really global, smart, macro investors in the world, they will make the observation, because we've heard it. We were on a panel with our friends at Goldman, and they, they were one of the people who made the observation. If you go to the United States and you ask someone, where is the financial center? It's New York. If you ask where the tech sector is, it's California. The entertainment sector, it's also California, Los Angeles. Um, and then sciences is kind of in a mix of different places. In this part of the world, it's all London. Sciences, film, television, creative industries, finance, it's all in one city. And that's very unusual because it means your talent base is extraordinarily concentrated, largely in the city. Uh, and I think for us, 500 million into our next deal, we're very, very excited about it. Central London partnership with a local council to basically bring forward stuff, land that has been uninvested in for generations. And yet it is one of the best pieces of real estate in all of London. We're super excited about it. London, who are the people and what kind of property is it? So the answer is, it is, we have found that the resilience of the creative industries has been extraordinary during COVID. At Olympia, the first things that went first all the theaters, all the live entertainment, all the hotels and all the restaurants were taken during COVID. Remarkable resilience in in those industries. At at the Savile, which we bought, the level of demand from the hospitality and theater industry have been remarkable. And I think for us, we think a new creative quarter for London is going to be special. But where we are thinking that there are other sectors in the creative industries that probably have untapped levels of demand uh, and we're very excited to be exploring those in this new investment. Awesome. Well, I won't press you any further, Lloyd, because I know that it's almost an exclusive, but I've really, really enjoyed uh, you joining me on the podcast today. Like I said, there's so many more questions that I have for you, but I really appreciate the wisdom and sharing a little bit about your story and what you're doing with New Capital. So thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the People, Property, Place podcast. If you found it insightful, feel free to share it with a friend or colleague, subscribe, give us a rating, like or comment. It helps tremendously. It'd be great to hear from you on LinkedIn. I'm super open-minded to recommendations of which guests you think we should get on the podcast or areas of the market that we should explore further. So do drop me a message. The People, Property, Place podcast is powered by Rockbourne. The team recruit experienced talent for real estate private equity firms, investment managers, REITs, property companies, and advisory firms across the investment, asset management, development, fund management, ESG, cap markets, investor relations, and general practice space. So if you're considering your career options at the moment or looking to attract top talent to come and work for you, head over to the website, www.rockborn.com, where you can find a wealth of resource to aid your search. Have a great day wherever you are, and I look forward to catching you next time.